Thank you so much for coming. Uh, this is a very interesting topic. Uh, it's one that, uh, as we were just talking just right now, it's one that's uh, on everyone's mind. So uh, before I start, uh, there is a Q&A app in here. I, uh, I expect there might be one or two minutes at the end. If you have any questions, put it in the app and I'll try to uh, get to it at the very end. But um, before I really start, I just want everyone to understand that uh, I'm not trying to be alarmist. I'm not trying to uh, light any fires anywhere. I'm not trying to offend anyone. I'm just trying to talk about what's happening in the world. And I'm trying to talk about facts. So I think if we address it that way, um, we can take any of the, uh, uh, let's say some folks might be uncomfortable talking about this subject, uh, but the reality is, is that it seems like it's happening. And the subject I'm mentioning is World War III. So back at the end of November, Jay Martin and I uh, Jay Martin here at VREC and I did a, a, a live online video event called Crisis and Chaos, uh, The Changing World Order. And the whole idea, the reason I did it with Jay was there's this huge question out there. It's trending on Twitter all the time. World War III. Is it really happening? So the idea was get the best people you can in the world together and try to answer this question. So we had a, an advisor to the chief, uh, former chief of defense staff of the UK. We had uh, CIA folks there. We had people from uh, top of the Pentagon, uh, top of the White House, a former White House advisor. We had Eric Prince, the founder of Blackwater, a large mercenary company. Uh, and we also had the former Supreme Allied Commander of NATO, General Wesley Clark, who, if you recall, ran for president uh, for, on the Democratic uh, ticket. And this is what he told Jay, which I think is very instructive. From the perspective of our potential adversaries, we are already in World War III. So I think coming from someone of his stature to say that we're already in World War III, at least that's how our enemies perceive it, or at least that's how they're addressing things. I think that that's how we have to address this challenge. And I think um, if you take a step back for a moment and you evaluate what's happening in the world, if you were gonna take on the number one superpower, which is the United States, and you were China and you were Russia, you would never attack them directly. You would never attack the US directly because you frankly, you couldn't win. You would try a hybrid warfare. You would try a whole bunch of things to sow dissent internally and obviously externally to try to sow chaos uh, in the greater US uh, allied network, so to speak, that's global. How do you define a world war? And I think that's something that we have to address before we actually get into the nuts and bolts of it. A world war, from my perspective, is when you have the same players involved in a geopolitical struggle, struggle in multiple theaters around the world. So obviously we have what's happening in Europe, we have what's happening in the Middle East, and we have all these other conflicts that are bubbling up and the Taiwan question, which we'll talk about here in a moment. We have the situation in South America with Guyana and uh, Venezuela. And we also have these other conflicts that um, when wars tend to break out, there's a lot of chaos. And I think we just saw it last week uh, with the situation between Pakistan and Iran, where uh, there was this exchange between the two countries and if you know anything about the two countries, they've actually been very close for uh, quite a long time, at least um, under, the, uh, under the cover, so to speak, diplomatically. And I was speaking with a, Pakistan, a retired Pakistani ISI officer, that's their intelligence service, and he had called me and said, what happened? Because we don't understand why this happened. Um, and I think that kind of illustrates the point that when things start to go sideways, chaos starts to creep in everywhere and just because you think you know the structure of how the world's put together doesn't mean that that's how the world's actually going to end up. So the reality is is that in late 2021, if we would have done this conference January 2021, no one had it on their play card that Russia was going to invade Ukraine. That was not something that anyone thought could remotely happen and yet it did. So let's, let's talk a little bit about what's happening uh, in the war in Ukraine right now. Obviously, some people think there's a stalemate. That's clearly the message that's being communicated uh, through Western media channels. Um, what is also being communicated is that Ukraine is uh, facing some severe difficulties. There's a lot of internal dissent that's going on. There's a, a confrontation that's happening between Zelensky, the president of Ukraine, and Zeluzhny, who's, right, who's the commander in chief of the Ukrainian armed forces. There's much disagreement about which way they should be going. Should they be negotiating? Should they continue to fight? Uh, who takes the blame for what happened with the failed offensive that, uh, that happened a few months ago? All those sorts of things. And it's actually getting bloody to the point where there are people on actually both sides who have been assassinated as part of the struggle that's, that's ongoing. Russia is ramping up military spending. This is something that came up in the news a couple of months ago. 
that in this year's budget, Russia is spending 70% more on their military budget than they spent last year, which I think illustrates the point that Russia does not feel that this war is over in any way. And clearly, internally, the truth is they can't lose. Internally, they, they know they can't lose. They're, they're going to throw everything they possibly can. And this is ongoing while we have the, what's happening in the United States. And obviously, the domestic political situation informs what's happening in Washington. But the reality is, is that Congress looks like it's not necessarily going to approve the money that Ukraine wants to continue funding this war. And depending on which way that goes, it's going to illustrate, uh, I think, pretty starkly where the U.S. sits in terms of these conflicts that are happening globally. Uh, CNN on Friday, I, I pulled this right out of one of their broadcasts. This is uh, verbatim. Pentagon officials have not held a single meeting since last month to decide on what to send Ukraine from the Defense Department stockpiles because there is no money left to fund aid packages. So with no money left and the fact that Trump seems to be uh, taking at least the Republican uh, nomination uh, by acclamation, it seems like uh, that's the direction it's gonna go depending on what happens tomorrow. Uh, it's clear that that war is potentially winding down, but the reality is, is that Russia may certainly not be finished with what's going on there. Then we have the Middle East situation, which I think anyone who's paying attention on Twitter or reading anything about what's happening in the news, this situation is getting worse and worse and worse. Uh, I'm speaking with a, a, uh, a top official in Israel later this week. Uh, if you talk to me next week uh, and go to resourcewars.com, you'll have a much better idea, grasp of what's happening, at least from the Israeli perspective. But the reality is, is that since the, uh, since the Hamas attack on Israel on October 7th and then their retaliation nearly three weeks later, uh, the situation throughout the Middle East is growing more and more dangerous. So um, obviously Iran or proxy, Iranian proxies have been hitting U.S. bases in Iraq and Syria. The Houthis have been harassing these ships all over the Red Sea, trying to cut off the Suez Canal, which they've effectively done. Uh, and then we have the Hezbollah question, which is located up in Syria, and all the northern cities in Israel have been evacuated, their population centers evacuated, because of the fear of what Hezbollah could potentially do. Now, I have spoken with folks who are in, uh, on the Syria, or on the Lebanese side, and they actually think that Hezbollah is not, is, is, uh, they're playing games with the Israelis and they don't actually want to fight because they know ultimately it's going to completely destroy Hezbollah's infrastructure that they've set up there. Uh, but the reality is, is that you'll also notice, I think it was on Friday, the chief of the IDF, Israel's Defense Force, publicly said that they were looking at, at, uh, at a war with Hezbollah potentially very soon. I think that was the exact quote. So we have that ongoing. And then we have what's happening uh, with the latest news in Taiwan. So there was an election in Taiwan last week. Uh, just to recap briefly, uh, President-elect William Lai won he tends to be more pro-U.S., but the messages coming out of him over the last week or so has been that he does not necessarily, uh, he, he wants to maintain the status quo. Status quo is actually the, the terminology that he used. In other words, he doesn't want to provoke China, and he obviously doesn't want too much U.S. pressure applied that they have to uh, turn into the porcupine. Uh, there's a concept that the U.S. Defense Department has that they need to turn uh, Taiwan into a porcupine that is so heavily defended that China will decide it's not worth the, uh, the price to potentially invade. Now, all of this said, the Taiwan question, when it comes to that, I have been told by uh, folks very close to the Chinese leadership uh, and actually folks that are uh, close on the CIA side that there's already an agreement worked out. Uh, it's potentially as soon as April and China's just going to take Taiwan. There's not going to be a war. The U.S. knows they can't defend it and there's, a deal's already been worked out. To what effect that's true, I, I don't know. The two sources are, are pretty reliable uh, in my, uh, in my uh, previous history working with them. Uh, so take that for what it is. Um, but whether that happens or not, it's clear that there's this pressure that's being applied to US hegemony globally. And it's happening with Russia, it's happening with China, and it's clearly happening with Iran. So, um, Something else that I think we should probably take into account, uh, because this is something that's filtering into the mainstream uh, news side of things, especially over the last little while, and that's that uh, China is running into this deflationary environment, that the Chinese uh, economic miracle is over, uh, and that there's no doubt that you know, China is similar to Japan, that you know, everyone thought Japan was gonna eat the US uh, America's lunch, and in the end, did not. 
The only thing that I would remind all of you is, is that in 1929, the United States had the crash and started this Great Depression that lasted through the war. And by 1945, the United States was running the world effectively. So 16 years after the Great Depression, after the start of the Great Depression, the United States was on top. So just because China's running into economic turbulence does not mean that they can't necessarily assume uh, the mantle of global uh, supremacy from the United States. And I think the Americans, uh, at least on the military side of things, I think they understand that uh, very well. You'll notice that there's been this steady uptick of news in Western media that we might be entering some sort of uh, conflict phase. So you'll notice that on, uh, it was last week, Germany's defense ministry, uh, there was a, a um, uh, I guess you would call it a memo, was leaked to Bild, which is a newspaper in Germany, suggesting that Berlin expects Russia uh, and the war in Ukraine to spill into Europe by 2025. So this was leaked to Bild last week. Two weeks ago, this really made a lot of news everywhere. The Swedish civil defense minister and military commander in chief said, quote, there could be a war in Sweden and Swedes should mentally prepare for the possibility. So clearly, they're, they're trying to uh, massage the, uh, the public in terms of what's potentially uh, around the corner. And most recently, I think uh, many of you, if you're on Twitter, you probably saw this because it went everywhere. Uh, the number three NATO official in the NATO org chart, Admiral Rob Bauer, uh, publicly warned that there could be a war uh, with Russia, an all-out war, and that Western populations needed to, uh, needed to prepare and the fact that we're in Canada, I think it's instructive. Uh, uh, Canadian media, given what's happening in Canadian media landscape, we don't necessarily hear what's happening in our own country anymore. But uh, in October, Canada's chief of defense staff, Wayne Iyer, General Wayne Iyer, quote, he said, uh, China and Russia, <clears throat> excuse me, China and Russia are at war with the West. They strive to destroy the social cohesion of liberal democracies, ensuring our model of government is seen as a failure. So he said this publicly. Okay, so this is the guy who's running Canada's military, make what you will of Canada's uh, military preparedness, but this is a guy at the top of the org chart and he's saying this sort of stuff publicly. So what's clear, as General Wesley Clark has put it, from the perspective of our adversaries, they think we're in World War III, and obviously from the perspective of military leadership throughout NATO countries, the United States, uh, uh, Europe, and even here in Canada, we also believe we're either in World War III or we're on the threshold of it. So look, if we're in a war, if we're actually on the threshold of a war, we need to figure out how to win it. As the number three NATO official, Admiral Rob Bauer said last week, and this is a direct quote from him, you need to be able to fall back on an industrial base that is able to produce weapons and ammunition fast enough to be able to continue a conflict if you are in it. So again, this is the number three NATO, uh, <laughs> NATO general, he's an admiral, in the whole org chart, and he's saying you need to be able to fall back on an industrial base that is able to produce the weapons and ammo that we need. Well, what is clear, I think we all know that North America's industrial base has been completely hollowed out over the last 20 years and basically transferred to China in the developing world, all in the pursuit of this idea around globalism that clearly did not work. Uh, it's a, It's a... Just take a look at history, globalism. It's a great idea, I love it. It was very, I made a lot of money from it. I think we all did, but ultimately it doesn't work and you have to prepare for a situation where globalism breaks down. And it is breaking down. And I think the, the examples of where it's breaking down are happening almost every day now. US NATO can't replace weapons fast enough for Ukraine. This is in the Western press everywhere. And uh, the situation in the Middle East is on the verge of going crazy everywhere. And I, I don't know if you've read this news, but the United States had a huge stockpile of artillery ammunition that was stockpiled in Israel. And they begged the Israelis to send it to Ukraine to help them fight the Russians before Hamas did what they did. So you can see that from the Chinese and the Russian perspective, if you're just pushing on America and all these little points where maybe the Americans weren't necessarily that prepared, what you're doing is you're basically, you're hollowing out their stores of munitions and the Chinese and the Russians are doing it with the perspective that we do not have the capacity to rebuild our infrastructure fast enough to be able to compete with what they have. And, and that's what I'm gonna get into here. So Raytheon CEO is a guy named Greg Hayes. Raytheon makes missiles, they're involved in avionics, they're involved in a lot of, uh, if you own a boat, they, even, uh, they do a lot of electronics. Uh, 
But Raytheon is a very serious uh, top five US military industrial complex company. And this is what he said last summer. He said this publicly to the Financial Times. We can de-risk, this is Raytheon, we can de-risk but not decouple more than 95% of rare earth met, uh, materials or metals come from or, or processed in China. There's no alternative. Hayes further explained that if Raytheon were to withdraw from China, it would take many years to rebuild necessary capabilities either domestically or in other friendly nations, other friendly jurisdictions. So this is from the US Geological Survey. Today, the US is more than 50% reliant on the imports of 51 minerals. Of those 51 minerals, the US is 100% reliant on imports of 15 of them. And of those 15, there are 12 that the Pentagon deems, publicly deems, critical. So in other words, there are 12 minerals that the United States Defense Department deems as absolutely necessary to the defense of the United States that they cannot produce domestically and are 100% reliant upon other countries to bring in. And I think the way to, uh, to illustrate this the best would be uh, a story about antimony. Antimony is an element that's used for just about everything to make munitions. You need it everywhere. And the reality is the United States doesn't produce any of it. So for example, there's a company called Skeena Resources. They're not here, but they've been here many, many years over, uh, several years ago they, they were uh, exhibiting here. So Skeena has a gold mine up in, in the Golden Triangle. They did a film for them about four or five years ago. So Skeena's chairman, Walter Coles, called me in the summer and he said, here's our problem. We can produce antimony out of our mine. So we have antimony and we can produce roughly 10% of what the United States needs to create weapons. But the biggest problem is there is zero smelter capacity in North America and in Europe to basically produce this antimony as a byproduct of our gold production. So in other words, this element that is absolutely necessary to make ammunition, the United States doesn't have a domestic or even an allied supply that's nearby. There's another mine, Perpetua Resources. They're talking here later on today. Um, you might want to check them out. They're also, they're around 35% of the U.S. supply once they get up and going, but that's four years away. So the reality is, is that the United States is in a situation where they need a lot of resource development and they need it like yesterday if they're going to do anything to try to head off what's happening in the world. Last week, a bipartisan group of U.S. senators introduced the Critical Mineral Security Act of 2024, but, uh, and they understand the problem, but again, they're still a year out before they even start doing anything on that, and quite frankly, given what's happening in the world, we probably don't have a year. So the crux of the issue is the U.S. needs to dramatically ramp up production of mineral production, and this is when it comes down to your money, and I have two minutes to tell you how you can try to invest in this trend that is probably only only going to be uh, more acute as we move over the next six months to a year. So companies I would take a look at for you, I'm not invested in them currently, Skeena Resources, the symbol's SKE, which I just mentioned, and uh, Perpetua Resources, uh, they're at workshop number one at 2 p.m., you'll wanna check them out. Between the two of them, if they can produce enough antimony, they'll produce roughly half of what the U.S. needs. Because it's such a critical mineral to production of what the U.S. needs, I think there's uh, two companies that you can definitely check out. At the same time, if you wanna um, potentially invest in companies, uh, taking a step back, you wanna invest in companies that are in jurisdictions either in the United States or Canada or in jurisdictions friendly to the United States. Because as we saw what happened with this Russia conflict, if the United States doesn't like what you're doing, they don't care, they're just gonna cut you off. If you were an investor in Gazprom or Esper Bank, sorry, like, you know, all those funds got tied up and, and there's nothing you're gonna do about it and it's probably decades away before you even get any money, money out of it, if you ever do. So you need to take uh, that into account. If you're investing in, com in companies that have exposure to China or, uh, well, nobody has exposure to Iran right now, but, um, Anyone who has exposure to China, I think you really want to think twice about that. Uh, fortunately or unfortunately, whichever way you look at it. Um, lastly, visit me at resourcewars.com. You'll want to sign up there. There's a lot of stuff that's going to be flowing out over the next, uh, especially over the next month. Some really interesting things are going to be happening you're going to want to check out. You also want to check out Gold Telegraph on Twitter. Uh, he is wandering around here somewhere, but he is probably one of the better guys to check out. Uh, Jay Martin, obviously. Elbridge Colby is another name. He's going to be Secretary of Defense if the Republicans win the White House. Um, 
and at Samuel Rines. I would really advise you to check him out on Twitter. Uh, he's probably the most plugged in guy that I know. Lastly, there are none so blind as those who will not see. The reality is, is that we are entering into a conflict phase, whether we like it or not, uh, and it's time to prepare. And there's obviously, I think, from the perspective of a Canadian and someone who loves America, uh, there's nothing more patriotic than investing in companies that are gonna help us win what's coming. Thank you very much.